Okay, there are people who love pasta, and then there's our first guest. He has taken his love of pasta to a whole new level with his new book, Anything's Pastable, 81 Inventive Pasta Recipes for Saucy People. We welcome the Sporkful podcast creator, Dan Pashman. Great to see you, Dan. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Anna. Thanks for having me. So tell us more about your invention, the Cascatelli, which is such a huge deal now in the pasta world. How did you begin the venture of making your own pasta shape? Yeah, it's uh, surpassed all my expectations for sure. I mean, so I have these three metrics that I use to judge all pasta shapes. You know, I think some might say a little too much about the eating process, but uh, <laughs> so these three metrics that I have are fork ability, how easy is it to get the shape on your fork and keep it there, sauce ability, how well does sauce adhere to the shape, and tooth sink ability, which is how satisfying is it to sink your teeth into the shape. And I think a lot of shapes are good at one or two of those. Very few nail all three. Spaghetti barely even gets one. You know, I mean, like, if you ever try to get a good bite of spaghetti on your fork, it's either too big or too small. You got danglers getting sauce all <laughs> over your face, then you finish the spaghetti. Danglers, have, no. <laughs> yeah, half the sauce is on your plate when you're done still. It's, you know, it's not, so I set out to try to do, do uh, make something better. So how did you go about that process? Because I wouldn't even know where to begin. It's such a scientific endeavor that you really d dove into. Yeah, well, it, it, and it was a three-year process. Everybody in the uh, pasta industry and my wife all said it was a terrible idea. <laughs> um, I started off by just eating every obscure pasta shape I could get my teeth on and trying to isolate variables. So, like, what do I like? Do I like long or short, tubes or flat, ruffles or ridges? Um, and I really seized on ruffles. I just felt like very few pasta shapes have ruffles. They're amazing for holding all kinds of sauce and all the little bits. I think they're better at holding sauce than tubes. And they're also just kind of fun in your mouth. They sort of create a playful texture. So I knew I wanted my shape to have ruffles. Um, but then I had to get it, I had to, you know, fine tune the concept and I had to get a dye made. The dye is like the mold. Well, it turns out there's only one guy left in America today who's still making pasta dyes. And he's like a little bit busy making pasta dyes for Fortune 50 companies. He didn't exactly have time for a podcast over the dream. Um, so I had to bug him until he finally had, took a meeting with me. Um, then I had to team up with a pasta company to actually get it made. So I was able to team up with an artisanal company called Spolini uh, in upstate New York, and they're around, all around the country. And so uh, about three years ago, uh, the shape was born. It's called Cascatelli. It's Italian for waterfalls. And uh, yeah, you see the picture there, and uh, I can hold it up right here. So a big part of what makes it so special is this space right in between. I'll show you. Right, let's get a close-up here. Right in between the ruffles here, see this? I call this area the sauce trough. Soft, sauce goes in between those ruffles, and it like it's like a Venus flytrap. The sauce cannot get out. And, um, you know, not many shapes will hold out a sauce like that. I love that. You've taken it so seriously to our great benefit. And I wanted to show you that we picked up the Trader Joe's version. So, folks, know you can buy the Cascatelli. I mean, what is that like to see your creation in so many stores across the country right now? I mean, it's incredible. I still buy it. I mean, I can get it for free. And I still buy it when I go into the store. So I'm like so excited to see it there. But yeah, it's in Trader Joe's. If you get the Trader Joe's version, a, a one little tip, I recommend you put it in a medium boil, not a super hard boil. It helps more of the ruffles to stay on. Um, the Spolini version, you can also order from Spolini's website or get it in a bunch of stores that they're in. So there's, there's also a Bonza version in Whole Foods that's gluten-free. So there's a few different versions. And yeah, I mean, it was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. My pasta shape was on the cover of Time Magazine, which is still crazy to me. That's insane. Uh, and I saw you post not too long ago that you actually finally received the official patent as well. That's right. Yeah. So I patented the shape. So I licensed it to the folks who want to uh, work with me and make versions of it. And yeah, I, I, I got a patent for a pasta shape. So that's pretty cool. I guess that makes me an inventor. That's incredible, which leads you now to as more people discover this new pasta and they start making their own recipes, you wanted to create a book out of all kinds of pasta because you felt like people weren't really using all of the ingredients that are accessible to us in pasta form. Exactly, so when Cascatelli went viral, I mean, obviously it was very exciting, and people from all over the country, all over the world, were sending me photos of what they're making with it, which was incredible, but there was a problem, Hannah, and that problem was that 75% of what I was seeing was tomato sauce, meat sauce, mac and cheese, maybe a basic basil pesto, and it just made me kind of sad. I just feel like, you know, it, it really drove home to me just how narrow the range of pasta sauces is for most Americans. And even I myself fall out of that tomato sauce rut sometimes. It's just so easy and so basic and so familiar. Um, but I just feel like, cascatelli aside, there's so much more that we can and should be putting on our pasta. So many, there's a whole world of, of flavors and ingredients and techniques and things that you can use to up your pasta game. So I said, what if I were to write a whole book 
of non-traditional pasta sauces. No, no marinara, no lasagna bolognese. I love those dishes, but I think there are enough recipes for those out there already. Um, and I'm gonna do a whole cookbook of non-traditional, very new, very different types of pasta dishes to show people there's so much more you can and should be putting on your pasta. And speaking of, one of the super popular items in your book is pasta pizza. Can you explain to us how that even works? It looks incredible. Yeah, this, is, this, this came to me in a vision while I was driving. It's literally, it is a pizza where the crust is made of pasta. You cook fettuccine and then you lay it on a sheet pan, you bake it until it turns golden brown. As you can see, they're golden brown and crispy on the bottom. And then ideally, if it goes just right, uh, I mean, it's really a simple recipe. You can cut it up and you can pick it up and eat a slice of it, just like a slice of pizza. My kids go crazy over this. It's a great party trick. You can top it like a, like a pizza. Um, it's super simple. You just follow the instructions. You really can't go wrong. And you pull one of these things out of the, out of the party or just, I mean, honestly, or Tuesday night dinner. I mean, you know, you, it's the kind of thing you can whip up and it's so much more fun than a basic pasta and sauce. It is so fun. Tell me what it's been like sharing this experience with your family. I imagine you guys have been eating a lot of pasta, but it must be so fun to share this journey all together. It is, you know, and we produced a series on the Sporkful podcast that's also called Anything's Possible about the behind the scenes making of this cookbook. Because I think a lot of folks, even folks who buy a lot of cookbooks, really don't know how they're made. And I think if you listen to this series, you will never look at a cookbook the same way again. The highs and lows of recipe testing. I did a research trip across Italy that you can hear about. Um, and you hear my kids and my wife giving a lot of opinions and, and it was very, it was great to have them involved. I mean, look, they're great recipe testers because they're honest. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, stings a little bit, um, but you need honest recipe testers. I would, I would share stuff with my neighbors and they'd be like, it's great, it's great. And I'd be yeah, like, sure. How can I make it better? And they're like, oh, no, nothing. You know, my kids are like, no, here's the problem. You know, so, uh, and so it's been great. And it's, it's cool that we have this book and we have this podcast series that now we're kind of like a, a document of several years in our family's lives. That, you know, my, the other day, my 13-year-old was like, can I take a copy of the book to college to, you know, to, I can cook these recipes when I get to college? So that was really cool. It's a great time capsule. You'll cherish that forever. And take me back to how you started the podcast because you've been doing this for so long. A lot of people didn't even know what podcasts were at the beginning of Sporkful. That's true. I mean, like, I, when I graduated from college, my dream was to host my own radio show. Uh, this was long before podcasting was a thing. Um, and I got jobs as producers uh, on different radio shows. And long story short, it was a very tumultuous time in radio. I got laid off from six jobs in eight years. And friends in radio were, you know, I was early on to podcasting because I was already working in radio. Everyone kind of saw this was going to be the future. Uh, I hadn't done much in food. I'm not a trained chef, but I have a lot of opinions about eating. And I'm a, kind of a quirky, idiosyncratic approach to food where I like to obsess over the tiniest details of the eating experience. And I thought, Maybe that could be a show. And that's what the Sporkful was early on. And, and over the years, over our 14 years since we launched in 2010, um, you know, we've expanded a lot. We do history, culture, identity, economics, comedy. We have a game show format episode we do once a year. Uh, I think there's really, you can talk about anything when you start off talking about food. And we, I think we bring a lot of substance. We also have a lot of fun. We learn a lot. And so uh, it's a really good time. Our motto is it's not for foodies, it's for eaters. Absolutely. It's a great shared language. Okay, Dan, don't go anywhere. You're going to share some more great stuff from the book when we come back from a quick break. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more Afternoon Live right after this. Thanks for watching Afternoon Live. We are back with the host of the Sporkful podcast and author of the new book, Anything's Possible, Dan Pashman. Dan, thank you for spending a little bit of extra time with us today. You're going to demo us something from your delicious book. Yeah, that's right. So you know, the goal of Anything's Possible is really to show people that there's so much more you can and should be putting on your pasta beyond the basic tomato sauces. So there's no traditional old Italian pasta recipes in here. I love those dishes. I just don't think the world needs another recipe for them. So. There's a whole chapter on pasta salads, because I feel like pasta salads get a bad rap, but it doesn't have to be gloopy mayo and macaroni salad. A, a great pasta salad can be fresh and bright and acidic, all the things you love about a regular salad. So I'm gonna do lemony tuna with olives, capers, green beans, and parsley for you. I love this dish. That sounds because so pasta. good. So great, so I already cooked the pasta, and all you do is, when you get three minutes left in, in the pasta, you drop in your cut green beans, and that blanches the green beans, they're already cooked. You drain it, and it's done. That's really the only cooking involved in this recipe is making the pasta. Um, I've got a dressing here that I made that has olive oil, preserved lemon. I love preserved lemon. It's got a, a deep savoriness that's a little different from a 
plain old lemon juice. You can get it in jars at Whole Foods and a lot of specialty stores. You can also make it yourself. Just look up the recipe online. We got olive oil, preserved lemon, parsley, garlic, pepper, um, and, and and there's a lot of parsley in this dish. Let me tell you, Hannah, I don't like when a recipe calls for like a quarter cup of parsley. Okay. Because you end up with like 90% of a head of parsley going bad in your fridge. If you're going to use parsley, use parsley. All right, so this recipe's got like a cup of parsley, so you can really taste it. So I'm going to take the dressing. I'm going to put it on over our pasta. Now, I do, I do recommend that you want to get good tuna for this dish. Yeah, right? that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. It is a little expensive, but like, think of it as the meat of your, of your uh, dish. You know, like you would spend money on steak, all right? You'd spend money on good chicken. So buy some good tuna that's really going to be flavorful. It should be soft and tender and flaky. Okay. So... So we've got the pasta, the green beans, we've got the dressing, which has got that, it's the, it's, in addition to the preserved lemon, it's got lemon zest and lemon juice. So we're doing lemon three ways here. Okay, now I'm going to add in the tuna. Here's my extra good tuna right here. That does look gorgeous. Yeah, see that it's big and flaky and meaty. Like, you should be able to sink your teeth into your yeah. tuna. Okay, so we're going to add that in. Got a mixture of olives, chopped olives, chopped capers, and more parsley. Going to dump that in. And we're just mixing this up. And this is like, you know, it's, it's so simple. And this is also a great make ahead kind of dish. I actually, you know, there's a lot of instructions that anything's possible for how to make pasta dishes um, in advance. Because, you know, I know sometimes you want it to be fresh, but you also get a company coming over and all that. So I actually cooked this pasta an hour ago. You drain it a minute early, lay it out on a sheet pan so it doesn't, it cools off and won't continue to cook. You can mix this together at room temperature and you're serving it as a pasta salad. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, you could mix this before the guests come. Maybe you drizzle a little olive oil on it to freshen it up, but it's going to be delicious and it's going to be simple. So good. And what specific shape are you using for this pasta? Oh, uh, this is one of my, so this, this shape, this is, this, now look, my, my book calls for 34 different pasta shapes across my 80 plus recipes because I just wanted to expose people to the range of shapes. That being said, for every recipe, I also offer you alternatives that are basic supermarket shapes. So you don't have to go out hunting if you don't want to. But if you want to try some new shapes, this one is called Sanye a Pepsi. It's basically like broken lasagna. Um, it, it, I, I call it Oops All Ruffles. Oh, it, it, it does like, look you know, like you know, that. You know, <laughs> Cap, you know, Captain Crunch has Oops All Berries. This is Oops All Ruffles. <laughs> it, it, this is a tough, uh, um, uh, Spallini, who also make my, my uh, Cascatelli, they make one called Reginetti that's almost the same. This one's made by Rustichella di Bruzzo. That's one of my favorite Italian pasta makers. Um, but any kind of shape that's got twists and turns is going to work in this dish. Okay. Um, the reche, strozzo pretti, there's a lot of fun shapes out there. And you've also introduced a couple of new to us pasta shapes as well, but are they older shapes that we just don't recognize as much? That's right. So uh, there's a couple of shapes, you know, after Casca Tatsali went viral, everyone's asking me, are you going to invent new shapes? And I didn't really want to because I knew how hard the first one was and I figured, you know, and it was so incredibly successful, I just knew, and, and I got lucky, there was luck involved too. So I just, you know, the stars are never going to align like that again. But I just, in my research, I had found some really obscure Italian shapes that I fell in love with. So I teamed up with the folks at Spolini to launch two of them. One is called Vesuvio, it's shaped like Mount Vesuvius. Um, and one is called Quattrotini. I, I named it Quattrotini. Um, the real name is Cinque Buchi, which means five holes. You can see how technically, if you count the big center hole, then it's five. But I think of it more as, I, I see four when I look at that shape. So we called it Quattrotini. They only make it in Sicily and only during Carnival. So it's basically impossible to find in America. Um, but we, you know, Spallini and I teamed up, and so that's in stores around the country as well. That's so cool. I love that you did all the research and brought all those pasta shapes and all of these delicious recipes to us. The book looks amazing. I've been drooling over it all day. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Dan. My pleasure. I'm going to start eating this before my kids come home. Okay, okay, go for it. Hey, the book again is Anything's Possible. We'll have more information on our website at katu.com. We'll be right back with more Afternoon Live right after this.